and welcome back to another episode of Whipped Out with Michael. And on today's episode, yes, you guessed it, we're going to be doing the history of wigs. So stay tuned. So I've been wearing wigs for a couple of months now, and I was really curious as to where do they come from, you know, why are, why, why are they a fashion accessory? So I did a little digging. And um, what I came up with is actually quite interesting. Apparently, uh, in ancient times, Cleopatra... Uh, she used to, she used to wear a wig. Julius Caesar used to wear a wig. It's not uncommon for people to wear wigs in ancient times due to different reasons like lice, um, heat, uh, illness. So, you know, and as the, as time progressed, um, we kind of find ourselves in Britain in the 17th century, which would be the 1600s. And Queen Elizabeth I was notable for having over 150 wigs made during her life to cover her graying hair. Interesting about this is, is that the average wig during that time period was about 25 shillings. Now that doesn't seem like a lot to us today, 25 shillings, oh that's a drop in the bucket. Back then, um, that was an entire salary for a normal, average person for an entire year. And that was just, like, the basic model. Um, Charles II made them extremely popular. He had a receding hairline, so he had over 40 different wig makers uh, that created wigs for him. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that men for the most part, with the exception to Queen Elizabeth I, men were predominantly the, the acting force that created this trend. Um, now, if you fast forward to the end, you know, to 1795, in Britain, they enacted a um, powder tax. Now, that's how famous, that's how, not famous, that's how popular wearing a wig was, that they wanted to tax it so that they could actually fund wars with France. Um, which gives you a really good idea of what the economic impact of wearing a wig or powdering your wig, you know, had on the actual economy. Um, it was an extremely popular, it was an extremely popular thing. Um, so because of that tax, there was a, you know, there was a duke. His name was the Duke of Bedford. Well, he protested this by cutting his hair extremely short and refusing to powder his hair. Now, that was quite shocking because he was, a, he was in Parliament, you know, but he convinced several of his, of his other friends in Parliament to do the same exact thing, and his haircut was coined and named the Bedford Level. It was, it was very similar to what the French were doing on the other side of the channel with cutting, cropping their hair short after the revolution. So now we're going to like shift gears and we're going to jump across the English Channel. And so in France, it was actually a little bit different. So um, Louis the Fourteenth, known as the Sun King, he had a receding hairline at the age of seventeen, and he was extremely self-conscious of it. His courtiers did, uh, made fun of him. So he actually commissioned and had wigs made for the rest of his life to conceal the fact that he was going bald. Now, you, if you fast forward to Louis the Sixteenth, you know, it was an extremely popular fashion. Because when, you know, as it works in the fashion world, anything the French do spreads around Europe. So at this point in time, by the time Louis XVI comes along, wigs are a part of fashion. They are part of everyday life for the aristocracy and the upper classes. Um, it wasn't really popular among women until Marie Antoinette came along uh, with her, you know, three and, and four foot high hairdos, some of which had, uh, you know, French sailing, you know, naval frigates sitting on top. Um, now, you may ask, why did wigs fall out of fashion? 
it was a combination of things. So over in Britain, they had the powder tax. And uh, actually, funny story about that is, is that we all know the term guinea pig. Well, that actually is a wig-related thing, believe it or not. Um, guinea pig was coined by several Whig party members because the tax for the powder was a guinea. So if you bought hair powder, you were called a guinea pig. And the tax was actually, you know, they were trying this out to see if it would, you know, if people would be accepting of it. So you were a guinea pig. So that's actually kind of funny that something that we say all the time today, it can find its history back in, in, in a wig. The other thing that I find interesting is, is that that pretty much spelt the end of it over there on the, on the British side of the spectrum. I think what did it for the French side was the French Revolution. Wigs were looked upon as the upper class, so pretty much French Revolution came along and everybody's losing everything from the neck up. A lot of people just tossed their wigs because they knew what was better for them. And believe it or not, that's pretty much been the fashion ever since, is to not wear wigs. Um, I think a lot of the connotation that people have negatively with wigs comes from a period of history that most people aren't even, they're not aware of it. Like, they're not aware that we may have preconceived notions about people wearing wigs just based off of, just based off of that. Just based off of the fact that there was a whole, a whole revolution fought over the fact that, you know, the aristocracy were, were seen as extra. And, and so I hope months. you guys found that interesting. Um, it was actually really fun to research all this and to read all the articles and watch all the documentaries. Um, I'm a real big history buff. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, leave your comments. Um, I really do enjoy reading them. I enjoy replying to them. And until next time, I hope that you have a wonderful, warm holiday season. Bye!